get started in the interest of time. Uh, she has told me to stick to schedule. So our first talk post lunch is by Madhusudan Venkateshan, Venkatesan from NCBS and he's going to tell us something about neuromechanics of finger contact. Uh, I think the mic is on. That's true? Okay. I never rang the bell for you. You shouldn't ring the bell for me. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> okay. Th thank you all for coming. Uh, post lunch, which I I'll, I'll try not to put everyone to sleep. Okay. So wh what I'm going to talk about is behavioral uh, experiments and, and theory dealing with humans and uh, motor behavior in humans. And the specific thing I'll talk about today is a subset of things we are up to in the lab. This is to do with contact with the fingers and how to make contact. Or as I very loosely say, how to hold an object. How to hold an object involves far more than finger contacts. And I, I'm not even going to really tell you how to hold an object. I'll just tell you how to tap surfaces. Let me first acknowledge three people who've been instrumental from my past. These are mentors and collaborators. Uh, Francisco is my PhD advisor who got me interested for in the first place in biomechanics and not just mechanical engineering. Uh, John Guggenheimer is a mathematician who, who also made sure I'm thinking at least slightly more rigorously than I used to. And Emma Todorov is a collaborator who's, who's taught me a lot about controls in general. And the work I'm presenting was done with them in some subset, as I'll say later. My lab is funded by NCBS and uh, very, very generously by the Wellcome Trust DBT India Alliance. So this is for pe people applying for funding, that's a fantastic source of funding. OK. Let's start with a typical activity that at least I and several people I know tend to do in a, in a common regular day. Read the Journal of Biomechanics. OK, so you read the Journal of Biomechanics handling an object. What, what does it require? Well, you want to hold the object and turn it. Let's try to sort of take this apart and try to understand what elements matter, what, what's, what's my reduced picture of this system. I tend to think of fingers as kinematic chains. That's jargon for links associated joint at some point and forming linear chains. Contacting an external world, the world itself could have compliant surfaces. Sorry, let me see if I can. No. Does this is this a laser pen? This button. OK, so finger contacting an external world, world with its own dynamics. My spring is a caricature of, of dynamics. But th this, this does not suffice if you really want to understand how animals or humans function. Because we are controlled by motors, which are muscles. And muscles are strange motors. So if you're building a robot, you try to put in a motor that's really, really strong. So you can think of the motor driving the skeletal system. On the other hand, muscles are also stretchy. They have their own elastic properties. So really, if you want to think about the mechanics of the system, you have to couple muscles dynamics or mechanics with the skeletal dynamics. So the musculoskeletal dynamics is something that is, cannot be really separated. And in fact, I'm going a little further. I'm saying you can't even just deal with the skeleton. The skeleton is often coupled to the world. So it's a couple dynamics you need to deal with. And I'll say a little about that later. Uh, tip typically use various sensors to drive some planned or unplanned control strategy. Okay. Today what I'm going to tell you about will not talk anything about sensory feedback, although sensory feedback is involved in at least one of our experiments, but primarily concentrate on this descending limb and how that affects the coupled dynamics of muscle plus finger plus world. Okay. So the first part I'll tell you something about is contact transitions. And this is really all I'm going to be talking about. This, this is the experiment that people do. So let me first describe the experiment, then I'll dis tell you why there's a, there is anything interesting in it. People come in, they practice this a lot of times. 
to make contact with this little pedestal which is about three millimeters in diameter, polished steel. The fingertip, they're wearing a little thimble, like when you sew or something like that. And, but it's a thermoplastic thimble with a metallic sphere attached to its end. So all this is to make sure the contact is very well defined, it's rigid, it's very slippery. So you, can't, you need forces which are very, very well directed. They're asked to tap this in synchrony with a metronome and after making contact, produce, keep maintain a static finger but push down. Push down either as hard as they can or 50% of as hard as they can. This is the variance we looked at. And let me step back a little bit and do a very brief index finger 101, if you wish. So the index finger 101, this is the metacarpal. The metacarpal is out here. Okay. And the three carpal, the three phalanges are out here. Okay. This is the very tip of the finger. This, it's, it's actuated depending on how you count, but for the index finger, unlike lots of other fingers, there is actually a reasonable consensus on how many muscles there are. And this people count as seven muscles. And I'll point out what those seven are. The F, the things that start with F are flexors. And the flexor is a big powerful muscle sitting out here in your arm. DI is dorsal interosseous, and that's a little minuscule muscle that's sitting between your index finger and thumb. Okay? And this picture is even more messy and complicated. These are taken from Francisco's version of someone else's version of the anatomy. Okay? Because the actual anatomy looks far more complicated. So the other four muscles are labeled here. LUM and PI stand for the lumbrical and palmar interosseous. They're again minuscule muscles. They're really, in fact, the lumbrical is incredibly small. It, you, you can barely feel it in most people. To palpate is very hard in most people un, unless they're rock climbers or something like that. And the palmar interosseous is again inside the hand. But the two E's are extensors as they are labeled and they sit out in the arm. A little caveat, while we like to call these as flexors and these as extensors, if I ask you to do a finger extension or push down, which is finger flexion experiment, and measure all seven muscles, all seven muscles are active. Another very classic neuro, I guess, neuroscience and neurophysiology experiment is to look probe the DI, because people have been searching for agonist antagonist system somewhere. The biceps triceps is far from an agonist antagonist because they even cross more than one joint. So the biggest hope was this DIPI in humans because they simply cross one joint and allow you to do this. That was the belief. A simple measurement, again, involving all seven muscles. And if I ask you to push in the direction of DI's action, which is towards your thumb, and push as hard as you can, the muscle that you see maxed out is EIP and EDC, not the DI. Every muscle is involved in something which apparently is an extent. So the notion of agonist, antagonist, I'm not going to use that. Co-contraction, I'm not going to use because in the absence of agonist, antagonist, I don't even know how to define co-contraction. OK. So these are caveats about not just the finger. I would claim pretty much every motor musculoskeletal system that I've come across, this is true. Now let me ask, what, what, what could be interesting about contact? Why could it be, even be a problem? I'll walk you through this picture. This shows not a, a bifurcated finger, but a finger in two postures. So this is a finger that's trying to move down, and this is a finger which, in, which is in contact with the surface and not slipping. And here in my caricature, they're driven by torque motors, motors which produce a torque at that joint. I can plot the three torques in a 3D space and ask, all coordination strategies can be plotted in this 3D space for this example. What, what you see here, a little arrow which has been labeled motion, is the torque required to move the finger down towards this point, not from way up there, but from somewhere very close to where you produce force, where, or where you make contact. This big arrow here is to push down and maintain static equilibrium. What you see in this case is the coordination pattern needed for moving in nearly the same posture is different from the coordination pattern needed for producing force in that same direction. You can, in fact, prove that this is true for any kinematic mechanism with more than two joints in the plane. So if the number of joints exceeds the dimension of your space by one, then that's true. But that poses a 
strange little problem. You want to make contact, which means you need to transition from this strategy to this strategy. If you transition too early, you don't land at the point you wanted to. If you transition too late after landing, you're not going to satisfy the mechanical requirements to produce force stably, which means you'll slip. And th this is a huge problem recognized in robotics and not just this. In fact, Whitney's paper deals with contact transitions, but also deals with just staying in contact. It turns out both of these for robots are a nightmare. One simple solution in robots is get rid of one of the joints, make it two-jointed, then all these problems vanish. Okay. But, but we have three joints. Why we have is a separate topic. If someone's interested, I can chat with you about it later. This is some ongoing research. But for now, take, take, take this as a given, that there are three joints. So is this, is this it? I mean, is this a problem and we just have to deal with it? It turns out not. So Dan Whitney, who is a very, very brilliant roboticist, uh, a friend and collaborator of his, proposed a solution to this entire problem. So Neville Hogan proposed a solution in a series of three papers. The first paper is a theory. The second paper is applications to various problems. And part C is actually experimental demonstration of his theory. So it's a beautiful set of three papers creating a whole new way to control things called impedance control. This picture itself is taken from a more recent paper of surgical tool design and so on for tele telesurgery by these two guys. Okay. So impedance control is a very simple idea. You say, make your controller behave effectively like you have a spring. So I want to go, let's say I want to push down on this surface. I don't control the torques to push the surface. I instead try to make my finger go into the table. But I have elastic objects or elastic-like my, my motors are mimicking elastic objects. So if I try to go through the surface and the surface doesn't let me to, my finger will deform. And in deforming, the elastic components will produce the right force I need. If I lay out the controller right and the assortment of r relative elasticity right at the joints, then I will get stable force. But what's attractive about this control strategy is you don't need to switch from one to the other. You're always trying to move down, and you're trying to move to a point that happens to be inside the table, and the table just comes in the way. And you produce force because the table came in the way. It's an interaction force. So you're not controlling motion, you're not controlling forces, but you're actually controlling the interaction between motion and forces. So it's, it's also called interaction control in some communities. Okay, so that's impedance control. And uh, what, the rest of what I'm going to describe started as a course project for me. Uh, long ago was to just for, for convincing myself really that impedance control is a brilliant idea. It's a beautiful, attractive idea. So let's let's see if humans do impedance control. Now, how how does one extract control policy in in, in a human? Uh, and that's sort of the experimental part I'll describe. This was done with Rob McNamara, who was an undergraduate in my lab at that point in. in during my PhD, this, is, this was my PhD advisor. The data for this was collected there. Uh, Sherry Bacchus was, was the electrodiagnostician who made sure we were at least poking needles in the right place. So we, we, we did the experiments, and Sherry was, was our supervisor to make sure we, we know what we're doing. Uh, I told you there are seven muscles, so we recorded from all seven muscles. We don't like surface electrode recording. So this is electromyography, the electrical activity of muscles. If I use EKG-like electrodes on the surface, I can also pick up a voltage signal. Finger muscles are strange. If you take the extensors, there's one muscle that splits into multiple bellies. And if you don't place it very selectively, you're going to get activity from muscles which have nothing to do with the index finger. And this is not, again, peculiar to finger. That's true of many, many parts of the body. A way to get very clean signals is to insert your electrodes into the belly of the muscle. What you see here are just hypodermic needles injected into the belly of muscle. And what you don't see are very fine wires that are going out of it. You pull the needle out, you leave the wire behind. So the, the hu human subject no longer feels the wire. The needle is, of course, at least slightly painful. Once that's done, you get electrical activity from all muscles. V various other things we do know is EMG recorded this way and appropriately filtered. I won't say much about what I mean by appropriate, but appropriately filtered is a very strong correlate of the force output or tension in the muscle. And so we're going to use EMG as a surrogate to measuring tensions directly. Okay, And the experiment itself, as I said, consisted of the following. 
people tap and what I've shown you here is the last tap and what you see here is every single trace we recorded 11 subjects three trials each okay. uh, excluding the practice trials so so they tap they come down all data have been offset in time to synchronize them to when contact happens then they ramp up force to different levels okay and while they're doing this we're, we're recording EMG and let me for now please ignore this picture very brief look at here the red is what raw EMG signals look like and when you filter it what you do is you rectify the signal and find the envelope of the signal and you call that the filtered EMG this is an arbitrary voltage unit you divide it by the maximum signal you can elicit during a static task you do a whole bunch of trials to find what's the maximum you could elicit so you can ultimately plot EMG as a percentage of max for every single muscle okay and what you see here are seven traces during the movement contact happens and force is produced if you take a small uh, a time window there are seven numbers which correspond to activity in each muscle and I'm going to call that a seven dimensional vector or a coordination pattern is a, is a name I'll use alternatively okay now I can record this coordination pattern and if I can understand what's happening to this coordination pattern perhaps I can actually get an insight into what the control strategy is so all I need to do is think about the 7D vector and how it's changing over time right and the one scalar way to do this is the following if this was my time varying seven dimensional mu muscle coordination pattern I can take some direction in the 7D space which I'll call a reference direction and in fact doesn't matter what direction I take and call the angle between them as the change in coordination pattern so one way to think of it is I have one vector a reference vector here the time varying vector can grow in length or change in direction a change in direction to me is a change in coordination pattern because you're now changing how different muscles are weighted with respect to each other a change in length is basically the same coordination pattern more or less yeah this reference vector what we chose it as is so people produce force go up and maintain a constant force at the maximum force they could produce we took the coordination pa pattern over there and called that as the as the angle between or the, the variable we track so you can this is just the dot product formula huge warning here and this is this again does not apply only to muscle data any high dimensional data this is simply a correlation right that's all the dot products doing Co correlations essentially deal with angles in high dimensions and angles in high dimensions are very strange beasts they do not at all behave for example if you in a high very high dimensional space when I say very high more than even six or seven if you take two random vectors and ask what is the most likely angle between them it's 90 degrees so if you see decorrelated high dimensional signals that's just a it could be an artifact of the fact that you're living in high dimensions so all so very very few vectors live next to each other and the warning with respect to what I'm going to show is the absolute value of the angles mean nothing it's it's a change and change over background noise that we, we pay attention to okay so the first thing we found and this was extremely shocking to me is I'll make the claim and I'll show you why I believe the claim to be true people make an anticipatory switch in strategies before contact not what an impedance controller would do their fingers moving towards the surface and about 60 milliseconds before contacting the surface all their muscle coordination patterns undergo a switch to that which produces force and then they produce force very consistently again what I've shown here is every single trace we collected this what I have labeled as direction is the angle between my time varying vector and some reference direction and what you see is the is this angle dives down towards zero not exactly to zero uh, and if, if I waited long enough all traces will go to zero because the reference vector is is defined as what what force you produce uh, or what coordination pattern you use to produce maximum force long sentence okay so it dives over here and what you do what you can see is there is a very statistically and very visually clear change in pattern before contact happens contact happens at the dashed line and the point where we can detect a statistical change is the dotted line which here is about 100 milliseconds before contact 
this is the magnitude of the coordination pattern that also grows before contact happens. Okay. And it's, it's also not at all surprising that the magnitude is small here and large later because the fingers are very light. So you, you don't require very high tensions to accelerate the finger. So that's, that's easy, easy to understand. All right. So we know it is not impedance control. It is an anticipatory switch. It is everything that, as a roboticist, one would want to avoid that humans do. This, to me, throws open many questions. The one that I do not yet have an answer for is why not use impedance control? What is the, I mean, we know what are the downsides in terms of practical implementation, but does that behaviorally matter? Is there a reason we do what appears to be a harder strategy? Yes. Very good question. We didn't do the blindfold. Instead, we had people looking at it, but randomly varied the height of the surface unknown to them. Uh, there, we did not see any systematic change in their force output as impedance control would predict. So we did, I'm showing you one fourth of the data. There's three other varieties of control experiments, including not tapping, staying there and ramping up, or pushing down lightly and then ramping up. And to ask behavioral parameters, like how much the force vector fluctuates, or how strategies change, so everything points to no impedance control. Good question, but I, I don't, I, short answer is appears to be no, but we don't have the exact blindfolded experiment. People refuse to tap on, and land on a 3 mm surface if they can't see it. Okay, so few questions, open questions it threw up, besides the fact that I don't know why not impedance control, is the transition has a relative consistency in when it happens, and of course, a hypothesis which was suggested by many is, the, is, is it simply the uncertainty in where the surface is and for some reason you want to transition strategies and hence you do it beforehand. Uh, but you also see something interesting about the data. So you're going from one tiny vector to a big vector elsewhere in the 7D space. What, what you see is the angle changes and then the magnitude grows. I don't know if you, you probably did not pay attention to that. but this starts changing well before the magnitude grows. Okay, and why this kind of change? What at least I was seeking is a more deterministic, not a noise-driven mechanistic explanation. And why I was seeking this is obvious, will be obvious in a minute when I show you what we find. Okay. So I will walk you through this. This is probably one of two slides with some equations. This is just Newton's equation applied to the finger. It tells you mass times angular acceleration of all three joints. This is Coriolis forces and centripetal forces. This is gravitation equal to the torque you produce. This is for a free finger moving through space. Very nice looking equations. Then collision happens. At collision, because your finger does not slip, the velocity in the x and y direction stops, but your finger can still continue to rotate. So this is one collision jump condition. And this jump condition tells you what happens to the angular velocities of these three joints. So imposing a constraint at collision imposes, causes changes in angular velo velocities at the joint. That's what collision does to you. But after collision is where all the nastiness happened. As it is said, mechanics is trivial. All complexity arises from geometry. And here, here you'll see this. You have inertia, Coriolis terms, gravity, the torques you apply, but you have this innocuous looking term, which is the torques due to the contact itself. The torques due to the contact is because there is an interaction force. When you make contact, the interaction force is probably one of the ugliest expressions I've seen. And this, is, this basically tells you that your finger is no longer an independent dynamic system. It's coupled to the world. Its entire dynamics undergo a change when it makes contact. True for every limb which makes contact. All the parameters here can be either estimated or measured directly from experiments. The one thing I, told, I made a big hoo-ha about when I started was about muscles and how one needs to pay to muscle elasticity. And the way we pay to it is not by in introducing seven muscles. That's, that's a horrendously complicated model with many unknown parameters. Instead, we in introduce a muscle-like motor. So this corresponds to what the neural drive tells this motor to produce. So it says produce so much torque. The actual torque is tau, and it's related by an intermediate variable, which I'll call activation. This, so this is a first order equation, which says if the 
neural system commands a, a pulse, the activation will rise a little sluggishly and that is basically driven by calcium dynamics if you wish and that is the time scale there. But once my muscle produces force, for it to be transmitted to joint torch, you have long stretchy tendons. So there is an elastic time scale and this is basically an approximation to the elasticity and what you see this, if the neural command was this nice pulse train, your, muscle, your actual joint torque slowly rises and shows smaller ripples. So this is a phenomenological model of a motor. The t what, what is important is the time scales match what muscle is and that we derive from, uh, sorry is a citation missing. This is from Art Kuo and Felix Zajac who have done beautiful work on hill type models given all their deficiencies but estimating parameters for muscles in different parts of the body. Okay. So we use this uh, in the context of an optimal control problem. And what I mean by optimal control is we want the force direction after contact to be as well directed as possible so that you don't slip. We specify some, we want to calculate what the control meaning what the torque at each joint is going to be in order to satisfy or minimize the force misdirection at the same time satisfy constraints like uh, you want to land on the pedestal and things of that nature. This is just details of what we use for this optimal control problem and uh, why we use, for those of you who do optimization, uh, we use a non-smooth method and that's because it turns out because of the collision we don't have smoothness and the problem goes away so we have to use, un unfortunately use non-smooth methods. But the good news is we always converge, we found as to the best of our numerical exercise possible a local minimum but whether it's whether it's unique or not doesn't matter in a way because it was a global minimum meaning force misdirection was zero so that the best it could do and here's what the solution looks like. First pay attention to the blue curve and compare that to the direction change in the muscle coordination pattern we measured. So this is the torque coordination pattern instead of the 7D space here it's a 3D space from which we extract the angles. The angle undergoes an anticipatory change before contact happens and that this, this is the neural command. This change happens about 30 milliseconds before. The actual torque itself, if you notice there were two time scales, the slower of those is 30 milliseconds and it, so the actual torque would change about 60 milliseconds corresponding to when EMG would change. The magnitude stays low and starts to grow only after the angle change happens. In the context of the model because we can mess with things like inertia, we can pin it down to the fact that the finger is so light if you increase the magnitude early and having changed the orientation already your finger will accelerate rapidly somewhere else and not land on the pedestal. Okay. That is the reason and, the, and again we can mess with the time constants in the model and this anticipatory control is simply a consequence of having stretchy tendons. If you do not change by now you will not have the right torques necessary at the time of contact. So stretchy tendons and light fingers dictate all the qualitative features we saw. Uh, Okay, so this shows you how the coordination strategy in one in the torques tau 1, tau 2 spaces, it turns out the optimal solution this torque is always 0. So what you see is you want to go from this vector to that vector, you grow this vector, come down, make this loop and go. So what the angle changes you saw because it is 3D in fact it becomes 2D we can actually see how the coordination pattern changes corresponding to these over here. Okay, so I will switch gears. We're leaving you with this message that humans appear to anticipate and switch strategies and the timing of the strategy switching appears to be governed by tendon elasticity. Switch gears to another set of data we collected during this same experiment. We, we said hey, you're doing all these complicated experiments of tapping, well I, at least I thought complicated, I still think complicated. Let's think about something simpler of just producing static force. Okay. And wh why is this even an in mildly interesting again? I, I will show, well I will first introduce some fair amount of jargon that exists in the field and give a caricature example as to what the jargon translates to. Uncontrolled manifold, minimal intervention principle, optimal feedback control often, it is not called even optimal control and uh, there is something called goal equivalent manifold. This, th these are all various jargon which barring optimal control the rest are equivalent to each other. 
And here is a, carry, a toy experiment that was done by Scholz and Schoner and later by Todorov and Jordan in a, in a computational model. This was real experiment. You, you ask a person to use either two fingers of the same hand or two hands and push down on two force sensors. And what you want them to do is maintain F1 plus F2 at a, at a constant level. You give them feedback about how much force they're producing, but you don't give feedback about individual forces. You only give F1 plus F2 and say maintain this at a constant level. So you, you can imagine you can trade off. One finger can be pushing harder than the other and so on. And in F1, F2 space, the, the task requirement is to maintain F1 plus F2 constant. And there is an orthogonal direction where F1 and F2 exactly cancel each other out. It, so you can have crazy variability here. And it doesn't matter. It won't affect your task performance and whatever metric of goodness of performance I give you. And lo and behold, not surprising, uh, you ask people to do this. People are sloppy, but selectively sloppy. They have much greater variability along this null direction where or the task irrelevant direction and much less variable along the task relevant direction. This sort of experiment has probably been repeated at least a hundred times in many, many different contexts and you find the same sort of thing. If it's task relevant, then you have lesser variability than task irrelevant directions in your control. But pretty much every single, is it, I think with no exception uh, until we did our little muscle recording, every experiment was at the behavioral level. But behavioral measurements have a huge problem. You have things happening at a neural level which affects your mu muscle tensions and you measuring some behavioral aspect. So imagine if my arm was stretched out and I ask you to stay at the same position in and out, being near me and away me, but I don't care about drift in this direction. If my arm is nearly fully stretched out, automatically you'll have lesser vari variation uh, inward and outward and much more in other directions as opposed to being this way. So the posture of the arm can affect the structure of the variability simply because of geometry of, of, of a double pendulum here. And that, that doesn't say anything about the control. So what we wanted to do was go down to the muscle level and ask what, what is going on. Uh, and that led to this piece of work where we want to look at is there structure in variability of muscle activations during static force production. And here, we ask people to push down and maintain a constant force. This figure wrongly says sandpaper surface. This is actually polished steel on polished steel, so very low friction. What they see on a computer screen in front of them is the vertical component of the force and a desired vertical component, which, which is a randomly generated polynomial. So it varies over time, and then it stays at a constant level. And the constant level, each trial is random. We do not give them visual feedback about the other force components, but they are constrained by friction. Because if, they, if the other for the, the tangential ones are very large, your finger will simply slip. People still awaken with me on this? If, I mean, if you don't understand this experiment, do ask. I can even stop here if necessary, so. Okay, no, I'll, I'll, I'll wind up very quickly. So, these, these are, again, the filtered EMG as percentage of maximum. And the experiment itself lasts, lasts 20 seconds. So you see things varying, things looking noisy. Uh, in the previous figure, what I showed, the blue curve is what we asked them to do. The red is what they really did. And the dashed line is what we predicted using EMG. How we predict using EMG is we take every trial other than the trial we are trying to predict for, build a linear model, a simply regression model between EMG and force output, and use that model to predict this specific trial. So it, it is fitting, but it's not fitting to using the data of this trial. And what we find at least is the, the quality of the fit by various metrics, whatever metric you like to choose, is extremely good. So the fluctuation in force we can't explain is about 8%. 91% of the fluctuation in force we can explain with EMG. Not surprising, muscles drive your fingers. Okay, that's the muscle activity. What was satisfying is the quality of our recordings was good enough to have such good predictive ability. So here is the regression model. The regression model is force equal to some bunch of parameters we need to fit multiplied by the seven-dimensional EMG and perhaps baseline force corresponding to the weight of your finger itself. Okay, you fit this regression model 
and we calculate this trial specific estimate of a mapping from EMG to force. It takes seven input dimensions and gives three. So the task relevant dimension, the size of the task relevant space is only three dimensional. There is a four dimensional task irrelevant space or one, what you would call as a null space. So simply the rows of this matrix is the task relevant subspace. It's a 3D space sitting inside 7D and the null space is a four dimensional subspace sitting in 7D. Okay, so you have these two and you can simply take the actual variability in muscle and project it into the 3D and 4D and ask how much of the fluctuation was in task relevant and how much was it in task irrelevant. That's exactly what we did and here this same trace projected into task relevant three traces up there and task irrelevant four traces down here. Qualitatively it looks like more variability. You can be more precise about this. Uh, in the interest of time what I'll do is I will skip how you do this calculation. It's, it's just linear algebra. Not, nothing. So you calculate a covariance matrix. We also calculate two related covariance matrices where we take this covariance matrix, drop the off diagonal terms. That's like telling that there's no covariation between muscles but has the same variability within a muscle. Or we take a diagonal muscle where the variance is proportional to the mean because we know muscles have signal dependent noise. More, more for tension in it, more fluctuation in the tension. So you can do all of those, project variance into each of the task relevant and task irrelevant and ask how different is it from one? Meaning is, it more, is there more variance in the task irrelevant? This bar chart shows the variance in the task relevant divided by the variance in the task irrelevant. If you use the full covariance matrix well below one and well below the signal dependent noise model. So something as trivial as signal dependent noise in muscles does not explain the kind of variance we see. And the diagonal matrix also has lesser asymmetry between the two, two subspaces, which tells you that the full matrix is necessary to explain the kind of structured noise that you see. So the nervous system is actively dumping more noise into task irrelevant directions at the level of muscles. It's able to do this level of independent control. And th th these were, this was just us picking fights with various people, I suppose. Uh, this is doing a PCA on the data. There is a widespread belief that there are muscle synergies that you, you have too many muscles compared to what you need to do. So the nervous system couples activation across muscles. Clearly there is one predominant component because the task was 1D. But that component explains perhaps about 50% of the variance. If I now ask at what point do I draw a natural cutoff and say the remaining variance is not necessary, there is no clear cutoff. So basically it's 7D, it's not a very, very skewed PCA. So you need all, all dimensions to explain the fluctuations you see. And none of these results were an artifact of PCA. As someone else earlier pointed out there's independent component analysis, which is stronger than PCA. It's not just sec second order independence. And independent components for the first principal component, component look the same. So we, we, we at least slightly more believe our PCA. Okay. So there are, so the takeaway would be structured noise is present. Does it imply control? We see greater variability in task irrelevant directions. We know it is not due to biomechanics or signal dependent noise when we know it's not simply some low dimensional synergy thing happening. There's, we, every dimension is involved. This supports a, a prediction of optimal control. If you have Optimal control, this is Harrison, Walpert, and later uh, Emma Todorov and Michael Jordan wrote a sequence of papers describing how to control noisy systems and you find in noisy systems you want to dump more noise into task irrelevant dimensions to the degree you can. Okay. And this is at least direct evidence supporting that happening in humans. Okay, I'm going to finish my talk and by making two plugs. Uh, one plug is for work that continues from this, we realize even this was very complicated. Let's simply ask how to maintain stable contact when producing force. And this is work that Neelima Sharma as a PhD student in my lab is doing. She's present somewhere, oh, she, she's right here, so you can pick her brain later about what she's up to. It's a very simple observation. I'm here, I'm showing you a mechanical simulation of a finger in contact with the surface, trying to push down with 50 newtons and zero force in the horizontal component. I've calculated the torques needed to do this, plug it into a dynamic model. This is a person trying to push down on a wooden surface. Uh, 
Okay? Uh, and both of them show something that happens often. Doing that is actually not a stable configuration. Much like a slender column will buckle, your finger buckles when you try to push down. That's the sort of buckling you see. And the time scale of that buckling is within the reach of feedback control. It is 100 milliseconds. Uh, but it's just about within the reach of mechano sensors. Okay. And what Neelima is trying to address is whether what we used to think of as inconvenient nonlinear properties of muscle are perhaps a very good solution to maintain stability here. I'll leave it cryptically with that and uh, you can ask Neelima more, more about it. I won't go through the summary in any detail. No impedance control, selective noise and ask Neelima. Those, that's my summary. And the second plug that I promised, there are two posters we have out there. One is worked by Neelima again, uh, completely unrelated to fingers, asking about why do bugs sprawl? So small bugs look like their landscape orientation and tall animals look like their portrait orientation when you look them head on. Can we perhaps get some handle on why you have this change in body sh shape and why don't we see 10 kilometer tall animals? What, what sets the height of animals uh, and consequently the mass of animals and uh, what she's attempting is a neural explanation. This is other work we did recently. Uh, Ak Akshay Srinivasan, uh, I see, he decided to end the work on throwing and using optimal control to understand how to throw at high speeds and uh, we felt very proud we discovered baseball pitching. So, but the de details of that are in a poster as to why we find baseball pitching. Thank you. We didn't mention any motor neuron synergies. So, is this complex control strategy in any way also constrained by uh, just the synergies of, of different muscles, and, and that similar motor neuron pools would uh, actually go into two different muscles or three muscles? So, let me see if I understood your question. You're asking synergies to across muscles. Is that constraining the observations we see? As far as I know, some uh, motor neurons would. Multiple um, so if you look at f fingers of the hand, each muscle has multiple motor units and individual motor units have distinct motor neurons in your spinal cord as far as people have looked. Uh, so in that sense they are independent between up from the spinal cord. Are motor neurons at the spinal cord coupled? Almost certainly there is huge circuitry. I mean one inch of spinal cord is about 10,000 interneurons. So humongous circuitry sitting at the level of the spinal cord, but at least we do not find any evidence to support low dimensional synergies. We have seven muscles and we need seven dimensions to explain the variance we see, even for a 3D task. So in one primary criticism that some people have had about the synergy literature is the experiments that were done were low dimensional and hence they find low dimensional synergies. You need a task which is sufficiently high dimensional. But in our case, the task was low dimensional, but still we don't see evidence for synergies at the level of muscle coordination patterns. So that's how far we can address it. Any three, any three jointed in okay so b both i don't know the only thing i can confidently comment about is the mus is the musculature and tendon layout for the different fingers these three fingers are remarkably similar and these two are remarkably the little finger and the thumb are remarkably similar to each other but the number of muscles that are involved in the thumb for example is 10 or 11 depending on how you count uh, what in behavioral experiments do not see the kind of independence of joint movement that you see at the index finger for either the middle or the ring finger. But that may perhaps just be a training artifact. One, so no, no, very related to what he said and so there's no sh short answer to that. The other three jointed things we haven't. I mean, I, I would be tempted to look at I mean, how do you tap and here we are in a completely, no, this has not been repeated in other, other animals or other limbs and segments. Yeah, good question.
if you were to do if you were to keep a nearly extend if you were to keep an exactly extended finger then the strategy for movement and strategy for producing force coincide that's simply because you've taken out two joints so the number of joints is in fact effective joints is less than the dimension of your ambient space but if you measure what muscles are doing at that point or what what joint talks have to be doing you you will find because, because if if i try to uh, let's see if i can you even see my so if i try to take my mcp joint flex that down the if i do this fast enough the acceleration governs that other muscles have to be active to keep the remaining joints flat which you would not so if i was to do this experiment and ask when would there be no difference i would put a splint on the finger make it a one day thing there would be no difference then at least there's no difference that is required in practice people perhaps will take a lot of training to get rid of what they used to do but that, that i have not done that experiment and i don't know the exact answer so yes there is a posture dependence but only at this extreme singular posture it, every other posture the two are different and it okay right so grass postures we plan grass postures very way ahead of the object and it it turns out to be a function of two things one if you're given an object there are some points which are better to hold than others and we appear to know this very well and we can compute this very fast even for objects we haven't seen before and uh, if you're going towards an object you 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 shape your grasp well before you reach the object so there is a lot of planning going on over there and to me maybe both upsetting and at the same time very interesting was we appear to be doing the hard strategy of planning things extremely well instead of letting elasticity of your muscles handle it why is but that i don't know why but cl clearly that's what people are doing okay i think uh, we should move on let's thank madhu